Hello and welcome to Switzer Investing. I'm Peter Switzer. Thanks for joining me. On tonight's program, we've got Rudy Philippek van Dyke from FN Arena looking at many things, but in particular the three stocks he would buy right now. And then we have the, uh, the Premier of New South Wales, Dominic Perrottet, who I interviewed last week, around the, his stamp duty idea, which could save up people a lot of money if it gets across the line. And if he does get it across the line in Parliament, other state governments might pick up on it as well, which could save a lot of first home buyers a real lot of money. And then we have Eleanor Cray from PropTrack or rea.com.au talking about house prices. She doesn't think house prices are going to fall by 20 to 30%. And I've also asked her what she thinks about the stamp duty idea from the Premier of New South Wales and whether that will help keep house prices from falling too far. That's the show. Let's kick off now with Rudy Philippic van Dyke. <laughs> Well, joining us now for our occasional catch-up is Rudy Philippek van Dyke, the founder of FN Arena. And if there's one person we all want to listen to, it's always Rudy. Rudy, great to see you, mate. Peter, I'm happy to listen to you too. <laughs> yeah, I think between <laughs> us we get it pretty well right. Mate, at the moment, what's your feeling? Like, I, I'm sweating on a great inflation number eventually showing up. And we saw last week those two days of 5.5% well, rise of the market on anticipation of some good inflation news, which we didn't get. Um, but what's your view on what this market needs to turn around and become consistently on the upside rather than consistently on the downside? Yeah, um, I, I, think, I think it's a bit early. I mean, um, I think um, when you and I spoke uh on occasion in 2008 2009 2010 <laughs> um uh, i one of my my sentences that was uh, at the time readily adopted by yourself was hope is not a strategy yeah and uh i think the, the, the part of the volatility that we're seeing um in in august in september and, and continuing this month um it, it there's a lot of hope there's hope that um, if central banks um, so-called pivot, which means they they stop tightening, or at the very least they uh, they go they go to smaller steps in tightening, that that might actually uh, trigger a big rally in the market. Um, and we saw that after the RBA uh, went for 25 mm. instead of for, for 50 basis points, we had in two days uh, quite a quite a strong rally, which also reverberated internationally. Mm. But I do think that, um, uh, let, let me throw in another, another uh, com uh, reference, which I have often used in the past as well. I think share markets are like a, like a teenage boy. Uh, they can only look at one item at a time and, and their, their attention span is quite, quite short. Yep. Um, I think if investors go along with, with, with the market and only focus on what central banks are doing, they are missing out on, on a very important development, I think. Mm. And that very important development is that we are now seeing profit warnings uh, coming from, from rather large companies in the United States. And, and we had, uh, we, we're now getting the AGM season in Australia. And we've started the season with a big profit warning by uh, baby bunting. Um, that's that's a bit of a of a not not so great start. Let's let's say it like that. Mm. I, I I think between now and February, I think approximately, we're in for a little bit of a rough ride because I think this is a time when um, declining sales or at least uh, slowing down momentum uh, is combining with still high inflation and and other impediments, and so companies will come out with uh, probably not so great results mm. and i think we will we will see that culminate into a rather subdued reporting season in february um, however um, as we all know uh, these things don't last and we may post february or maybe even before february considering our situations are etc mm. we might see a bit of a bottoming process in the market and then we might be preparing for the upside but i think at this point in time it seems a bit early to me um, another example today, uh, we saw uh, NIB, the, the health insurer, 
uh, yes, they announced the capital raising, but also their their market update wasn't wasn't flash. It was, it was basically um, uh, going backwards compared to last year. Um, Bank of Queensland reported today that is that's been well received, uh, but Bank of Queensland is a beneficiary of of higher cash rates, higher interest rates, higher bond yields, and that makes it different from an uh, from for example a baby bonding. And, and I think investors uh, post this, the, whatever the CPI number will be, uh, are rightfully so um, cautious in what companies uh, will now report to, to their shareholders and to investors. Um, I think the coming weeks might be a little bit uh, volatile and edgy sketchy, I think. Okay. So uh, underlining your brilliant objectivity, something that many people in the markets are not good at, um, you left out CSL. Now, one of your beloved companies, which actually reported pretty well in terms of its profit outlook. I is it an outlier in that sense? Yes, in, in the sense that I think the, the prospects for, us, for CSL are absolutely uh, are great, right? both this year and next year. And, and I see with every update that is being um, published also by, by analysts who cover the stock, they, uh, it, it's always positive, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the share price is not, fall, is not really following in that step, but that's, that's just what the market sometimes does. I mean, you just have to keep an eye on the, on the, long, on the long run. Um, one of the reasons why, um, why CSL should be on people's radar, of course, is because the market hasn't been paying attention right now. But uh, it, it would seem that this year's risk off uh, periods uh, globally are constantly um, going hand in hand with, with absolutely a shellacking of the Aussie dollar. And, and of course, that should, that should all else being equal, that should actually translate into, into much better prospects for, for CSL, which, it, which uh, generates the majority of its revenue uh, in US dollars. Um, it hasn't. Because the market is just, I mean, uh, its, it's attention is, uh, is all over the place. Okay. Um, the other thing, Peter, I, sh I should say is that, of course, bear markets, they always provide opportunity. Mm. And, and they would also provide opportunity even in, in volatile times that we might, we might be ahead of us. And I, I do think that while the short term outlook for inflation is, is uncertain, I do think that the, the outlook for bond yields is that we are probably at or near a peak for the cycle. Mm. And that should in particular be a, a positive for those segments of the share market that have so far suffered from uh, bond yields uh, weighing on valuations. Okay. And that would, all, that would also include CSL, of course. But uh, I, I would, I would uh, point out two particular sections in the share market locally. Um, one is the, are the gold producers. And the other one are the are the local REITs, the real estate investment trusts. Yeah. Um, in particular, the second group, and, and you can even even include the gold producers as well. They they've been really beaten down this year, and and I think they are simply waiting. Both sectors are simply waiting for bond yields to settle and to start coming down. And I think that 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 will improve prospects for both sectors uh, significantly. Okay. So. Uh, when I think of gold producers, I always like Northern Star. Uh, I just think it's a well-run company. Is there a better company that people should be thinking about? Well, if, if people ask me, if I, uh, I always um, tend, to, tend to nominate Northern Star as well. And why is that? It's a very good reason for that, in, in my view. It, it seems to have less operational risks than, than many of the others. It, it, is, it is a better operator. But most importantly, at these levels, it pays a really a decent yield. Yeah. And while while the recovery of the gold sector, as in general, is is uncertain about the timing, um, it's easier to wait when you're cashing in on dividends. Yeah. And uh, and for that for that reason, I think you you can sit there and just wait for the for the recovery to arrive. And if it if it takes a little bit longer, in the meantime, you're cashing in on the dividends. Yeah, okay. Let's go to the REITs now. Now I, I've kept liking. Goodman Group because it's industrial um, and I know all the analysts on our FN Arena really like Goodman Group but let's just mm. say 
that's uh, if, if, a, if a person hasn't got Goodman in their portfolio, mm. it's probably time to do it because the price is down. But what's the other REIT that you would favour um, in, in, to go into someone's portfolio that currently doesn't hold a REIT? Yeah. Goodman Group, and I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a shareholder of Goodman Group as well. And, and, and the adv disadvantage of Goodman Group is, is that these days it's being priced as a growth stock. Yeah. And that means that the yield is, is, is quite low. Most people who, who would like to add or have the REITs in their portfolio, they probably do it for the income. Um, there is a REIT which, which I own personally. It's, it's home co. Um, it's not the daily needs read that's a, that's that's the sister company but they they also everyone likes that one too uh the, i pref, i i i have the wellness and and healthcare healthcare and wellness read uh the company codes are hdn and hcw for memory mm -hmm. and um they are both i think heavily undervalued uh, a relatively low risk profile and and excellent assets um the other thing which I think which which might actually be a, an even lower risk profile is I was recently uh, being asked about a Vanguard uh, ETF, which is available in Australia. And it is an ETF that combines um, the best uh, copies, the, the ASX 300 reads in Australia. So all the reads that are in the ASX 300 yeah. are, are in the ETF. Yeah. And I think for memory, it's VAR, I think the code. Um, but anyway, if the code is wrong, we can still find it. The advantage of that one is it, it's 70% uh, Goodman. So you still get Goodman. Yeah. Um, the, the second largest holding is Center Corp. Uh, so those are basically the two largest holdings. But the advantage here is, is that you still get the quality of Goodman Group, but you get a 4.4% yield uh, because all the other reads in there, they basically pay out the dividend rich, that, yeah. that Goodman that Goodman doesn't do. Yeah, VAR. And mm. and uh, and that might actually be for those who seek income. You still get Goodman, but you get four percent, four point four percent yield on top yeah. of it. At a time when a lot of people who are close market watchers think that REITs have had a bad time, but they're 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 uh, close to having a good time on the market. So that's a, a good thing, uh, Rudy. Um, I don't know whether you pick this up, like like me. I know you read very widely when it comes to market things, but um, I've been a great fan of buying the dip. But I'm a courageous long-term investor. But I do love the the latest is that uh, some experts are saying uh, sell the rip. So when the market goes up, be a seller. What are you? Are you a buyer of the dip or a seller of the rip? I mean, to be honest, if I if I have to uh, answer with what I've been doing, I've been doing, I've been observing both of them. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> I've done, I've done very, I've done extremely very little, and that's also because my macro view is that the, the market is, is 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 probably still heading for for lower levels, yeah. um, and, and and with a lot of volatility, and also it depends on obviously what you have in portfolio already, yeah. and and but I I would say. Um, if if I'm if I would be looking at putting uh, money in the market, I would be doing uh, going the anti cyclical or the or the contrarian yes. trade from here. I would look for the for the ones who have been beaten down, like the gold producers, the reeds. I think that's the that's the least mm. risky uh, way of, of putting money here. And and under any circumstances, I think you you by definition now have to have a two year, three year, if not five year view. And that means that you shouldn't you shouldn't be that worried about the next rip or dip. Um, you just buy companies that that, that you are comfortable with. That uh, over a three to five year time frame, the share prices will be a lot higher. Mm. And and mm -hmm. and and in good cases, you might uh, in the meantime, if it takes a little bit longer, you just collecting in the, the dividends. Okay. Last question then, but of course it'll be a long answer. I want you to nominate three really good companies that you think are worth buying now because the market has really looked mm. at them, seen them, as, them either as a growth or a tech company and they don't want to buy them short term, but you feel long term mm. they're such great plays and the prices are really attractive. What are those three stocks? The okay. Rudy Philippic destroyers. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll steer away from the usual suspects Good. because, okay. uh, as, as, as you know, I, mean, I can easily nominate ResMed, CSL, yeah. uh, uh, REA, CarSales, you name yeah. it. But okay, let's let's try a few different ones. Yeah. Um, 
I couldn't help but noticing that um, alternate group uh, is co is continuously falling. Yeah. And and I think well yes the business at the moment is, is not profitable yet and that they're, they're, they're paying for that. But I do think that that on a three to five year horizon you're probably sitting on one of the uh, success stories on the ASX yeah. globally. Yeah. Um, another one, uh, and I definitely own this one, is uh, Next TC, yeah. uh, which I think is, is, I mean, Marcus is absolutely being silly here. Um, but then again, I mean, Nasdaq falls, uh, uh, people put a label of, of uh, technology on it. Uh, at face value, it's not profitable, et cetera, et cetera. So the share price just falls. Um, and then the third one, I have to find a third one somewhere. Well, maybe I'll, I'll nominate a, a read. Um, oh no, 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 no! I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really do a surprising one here. I think at this share price, Telstra is an excellent buy. Yeah. Um, the shareholders will will soon um, uh, uh, give the green light to the to the sale of the the, the remaining infrastructure assets. Yeah. Uh, in the current context, that is almost by definition going to be an upside surprise, and that means Telstra will will by definition. Uh, uh, have, have a chance to, to generate an upside surprise, if not through dividends, then through to the special uh, capital management. Yeah, fantastic, mate. As always, great talking to you and thanks for your insights. Okay, okay, Peter. That's Rudy Philippeck van Dyke, founder of FN Arena. Thanks for joining us, Premier. Thanks, Peter. Um, there are lots of questions I want to ask you, and, and the really exciting ones will be at the end. <laughs> All right, <laughs> once I get to know you a bit we'll better. But you know, I think you, you made a name for yourself talking about stamp duty. Yeah. All right. W what's the big issue now, and where are we at with the stamp duty changes? Well, we're going to introduce legislation to the parliament, um, more than likely uh, in the next couple of weeks. And what we're offering first home buyers is a choice: you can either pay the upfront stamp duty that you pay today. Um, or you can pay an annual amount in line with you know something similar to council rates. That's how we're structuring it. So you're looking at probably you know, if you're looking at an average um, apartment worth eight hundred thousand dollars, you pay thirty two thousand dollars upfront stamp duty if you want, mm. or you could pay a thousand dollars annually. Yeah. So this is all about giving people choice. And yeah. I think in in terms of providing particularly young people an opportunity to reduce the time they have to save for a home, this is something that will give them a leg up into the property market. What are your opponents saying? Is it a tax forever or something like yeah, that? They, yeah, they call it a forever tax. Yeah. But uh, there's a thing called stamp duty as well. And every time mm. you buy a property, you're paying a significant amount of tax. So in, 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 in many ways, mm. um, it's, it's also a lifetime tax on a property. And stamp duty is a terrible tax. It yeah. was, it's become what it should never have been. It's become a, a lifeblood for um, state governments over time mm. um, for their finances. And I think there's better ways of doing things. Yeah, I, I know you're not a political opportunist you know, because you're a rare politician, but would you say then, when you try to sell this, I'm effectively reducing the price of a home because if stamp duty is on top and you're taking that away, it seems well, like you're doing. Well, well that, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think what people forget is that people don't stay in their homes for a substantial period of time. Yes, there, are some that do. there are some that mm. do. Mm. And what I want to do is allow people an opportunity to, to make a choice that suits their financial circumstances. Mm. And what we're seeing uh, in New South Wales particularly is that the time it takes for people to save for stamp duty, it's another two and a half years. Mm. So by the time they've saved that up, they're actually going backwards um, when it comes to purchasing their home. So yeah. um, it reduces the cost for them. It provides greater mobility and people can move um, uh, when they when they want to, and I think we need to do everything we can to reduce that horrible burden that stamp duty places on families across our state. So, what's in it for you? Uh, people getting access to their keys mm. to the great Australian dream. Yeah. There, there, there is no, there is no better wealth creator, in my view, than home ownership. Mm. And the more we can do, particularly at a time, yeah, particularly a time in Sydney where it's very hard to get into the property market, and yep. it's every parent's concern. I mean, I look at with my kids, and I just constantly think, how are they going to buy? property in Sydney. Mm. So everything that we can do on the demand side and on the supply side, we should be um, to enhance it. And you know, not all policy is going to be perfect. Mm. I accept that. Mm. But if we don't look, we, we, we need to look at more innovative ways of doing things. Dom, I've um, written about this many times. 
and, and it might be wrong. Uh, you, you should have done the numbers. But a new property out there, created by a developer, ultimately for first home buyers or, or young, yeah. about a third of it, I was told, was taxes all, from all different levels, council, federal, state. Is that a, f a, a fairly accurate number? Yeah, it is, and and, it, and it's a substantial cost to people. And you, you know, the council rates, right. the stamp duty costs, it, it's prohibitive. But have state and federal ministers ever got together? Let's just something about this, because if we increase the supply of properties, we then also take away the excessive price rises that a lot keep a lot of people out of the housing well, market. Well, I, I, when I was treasurer, I had very good discussions with the Victorian treasurer, Tim Pallas, at the time. Mm. And we both believed that this was something we needed to move on as state governments. Um, and I think it's important we do it with the federal government. I, I'm a big believer, the way, part of the ways you get reform achieved and over the line is if we can do it across party political lines. Yeah. But, yeah, the federal, but the federal government has a role to play in that as well. And you go back to Keating and the competition reform payments, um, under Tony Abbott, you had asset recycling incentive payments. We really need to do something in this country to incentivise state governments to drive productivity. And I believe the federal government can provide financial support to the states to achieve it. And if we drive productivity, like all of the recommendations that are in the Shifting the Dial report, what you'll get is better productivity, stronger economies, and who does that help as well? The federal government coffers. So I think it's a win-win for everyone. But the hard thing is, normal people don't understand what productivity I know. is. <laughs> Yeah, you got to come up with a, a much sexier term to sell that. Yeah, that that's true. But yeah. we, what we what I think one one thing we have probably learnt during the pandemic though is the importance of a strong economy. Yeah. I think we are now realising the challenges that come from a softening economy for families across the state. We're seeing that at the moment with rising interest rates, with rising inflation, mm. um, and um, strong. Hopefully, from my perspective, that we can bring people on the journey of the importance of strong economic management, but reforms. <coughs> that you know reform is tough it's mm. so easy for people to become i think and politicians to become addicted to the status quo because change is hard mm. but change can be good and if we don't change look at new ways of doing things and sit there and say well hold on if we're going to set up you know the tax system in this way if we're starting again if we're starting all over again would we set up the tax system in the federation where we have certainly not mm. would we set up the health funding arrangements the way we have certainly not education if you started with a blank canvas, you would do things a lot differently. And I think part of the challenge of being in public life is bringing people with you on the importance of change um, and show that that's going to not just be better for them, mm. but for their kids. What about the land tax changes suggested by the Queensland Premier? Well, I didn't like it. Yeah, you want to explain to normal people what was going on there? Well, the reality was what they were trying to do mm. was tax um, other people in other states based on their land holdings. Now, I have no problem. So if a Sydney person had a, a Brisbane property. And a Sydney property, yeah, so that would then be included, multiple properties, yeah. that would then be included in what would the classification of the threshold. Hmm. So what you would actually find is that you may have a property um, in Queensland at the moment that is exempt from paying annual land tax, but because of the combined nature of your properties in hmm. other states, hmm. Uh, ultimately, you'd be slugged with thousands of dollars. And, and, the, and, and the ridiculous aspect about the change was that it was only going to raise, from what I understand, around $20 million a year. Mm. But you'd have mum and dad investors, self-funded retirees, who would all have been hit with this tax uh, at a point in time where they've structured their, fi their finances in a way mm -hmm. um, for their future growth. But was this a, a national idea that other state um, uh, treasurers thought, hey, this could be okay? Well, well, I remember when I was treasurer, this being raised um, by certain treasurers at the Board of State <laughs> Treasurers. Um, and I never liked the idea. Mm. I never liked the idea um, at all. And I think it goes against the Federation. Um, but that was a few years ago now. So somehow, out of, some, out of somewhere, uh, the, uh, the Queensland Treasurer has picked this up and run with it. Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, it certainly got the death that it deserved. Okay, so it's gone. In our continual search for what's really going on in the housing market, we're talking to uh, Eleanor Cray, who's a senior economist at PropTac. Uh, good, good to see you. Great to be here. Now, Eleanor, um, you know, I, I was reading off an old press release which kind of anticipated that there could have been a possible 0.25% in, 
interest rate rise and that Reserve Bank meeting. Given the fact that there has been, has that influenced your team's projection of what might happen to house prices? So certainly um, for, for most of us, the 0.25 basis point rate hike that we saw last week was smaller than expected. Uh, now the cash rate is sitting at 2.6%. Maximum borrowing capacities uh, for potential buyers at the moment have been constrained by now more than 20%. So that will continue to, to shrink buyers' budgets and will continue to weigh uh, on property prices throughout spring, particularly um, as interest rates likely continue to rise in smaller increments uh, from here. Okay. Um, uh, last week, I, I talked to one of your colleagues uh, who was kind of making the case that maybe the the overall national house price fall wouldn't be as serious as 25 or 30 percent, which I think are the, the worst case scenarios out there. What, are you, what is your best guess? And we know it's a guess, but you know, we don't know how many interest rate rises are going to be. We don't know uh, whether Australia goes into a recession or not. I'm betting we won't. But still, what's your best guess of what you think might happen to national house prices over the next two years? Look, I think the kind of 20, 25, 30% price falls that some people are expecting are very unlikely, um, particularly now uh, in light of the fact that we have seen the RBA shifting back to that um, smaller pace of rate rises. I think there's a few factors that are going to play into the fact that the RBA can potentially be a little bit less aggressive when it comes to, to rate hikes from here on, here on out. Mm. Um, so number one, um, inflation psychology or inflation expectations within Australia have risen, um, but they haven't risen as much as they have, say, elsewhere in the world as well. Wages pressures um, remain much more muted relative to, to say, other um, developed economies or G10 peers. Yeah. Um, and of course, there is also uh, this sort of ongoing risk of global slowdown with uh, weak US growth, UK, China, the Eurozone as well, which is a key risk, which the RBA are watching. And of course, the fact that uh, many borrowers at the moment are actually yet to really feel the full impact of rate rises that have been pushed through to date due to the lag in terms of um, pass through to existing bank customers, also the large amount of borrowers that were ahead on their repayments and the large amount of borrowers that are on fixed rates, which are yet to expire. So that means that we, I guess, kind of watching and waiting for what the true impact on household spending will be. And it is likely that with the cost of living having risen, um, with wages pressures remaining muted, uh, that there will be a slowdown in household spending and that many households will be forced to make budgetary adjustments. So it does mean that we are probably looking at a slowdown ahead and that the RBA will be able to be uh, less aggressive with respect mm. to rate hikes. So I'd be expecting potentially the terminal rate to be um, around 3.1%. So just over, just um, over the midpoint of the RBA's estimated neutral range, which is 2.5% to 3.5%. Mm. So that means number one, um, that the uh, less aggressive rate hiking trajectory um, rules out some of those really uh, outsized house price falls. And we also have some positive factors on the horizon or playing out now that will also offset the decline in prices that we are seeing to date. Number one, the rental market remains incredibly tight. Rental price pressures are strong right around the country. And that potentially um, encourages uh, people to buy, people to enter the market, um, and of course, um, investor activity as well in the period ahead. Um, we've also got a, a strong rebound in foreign migration as well, um, and low unemployment, mm. which I think will also offset uh, the declines in home prices that we're seeing at the moment. So I'd certainly be sitting on the more moderate end of the spectrum when it comes to forecast home price falls, probably somewhere around the 10% mark on, yeah. on a national level. Well, one thing I don't like is my commentators being on the high end of the spectrum <laughs> for, under any circumstances. Uh, now, now, one interesting development, I don't know whether you guys have factored this into your analysis, but I bet you you have. Um, if uh, the Premier Dominic Perrottet 
gets his alternative um, stamp duty um, uh, suggestion up, uh, legislation up, that, that, that I, I, I'm presuming will possibly add more first home buyers back into the market. Is that something that could also put a bit of a, a floor under house price falls? Yeah, it's certainly going to be a, a factor, I would say. Um, now, number one for first home buyers, we know that um, it's accessibility that is the key issue. And um, the deposit burden is really the largest hurdle to home ownership, uh, to which stamp duty uh, can add years to that journey, mm. uh, given that additional upfront cost. So certainly for first home buyers, if we do see um, this bill introduced, it will make a significant difference in terms of incentivizing or allowing some to purchase sooner. We do expect that it, it will be the more popular option to, to opt for that um, land tax rather than the upfront cost, given that it, it has the potential to, to shave um, many months or, or years off potentially off uh, the journey to mm. purchasing the first home. Yeah, and it effectively means that lots of um, first-hand buyers will be borrowing, say, $20,000 less than they would have, because a lot of people borrow for the stamp duty as well. So that will also mean that lenders can probably say yes to slightly higher amounts. Potentially, and I think, um, you know, it's going to be another factor that probably um, underpins more prevalently the apartment market. So we know that over the last couple of years, it's um, although we have seen extraordinary home price rises, it's been a bit of a two speed market in terms of the house prices have uh, significantly outperformed unit prices with lockdowns, restrictions and less, invector, less investor activity um, weighing on um, unit price performance. I think home uh, house prices have risen uh, more than 30% uh, since March 2020, but unit prices, it's it's only somewhere like 12%. Mm. Um, so there is a significant price discount there um, and clearly a, a lot more uh, affordable options in the unit market mm. uh, and uh, options within various property price caps for, for the government incentives as well when it comes to uh, first home buyers looking uh, for that first home. So likely a factor there that will continue to underpin the unit market. And of course, um, we already kind of touched upon it, but uh, the rental market also being incredibly tight um, with those strong rental price pressures, rebounding foreign migration. We know that overseas um, search on realestate.com.au uh, has uh, risen a, a very large amount in recent months um, when it comes to overseas searches to rent. So another factor there likely to kind of uh, buoy, I guess, the apartment market with investors potentially focusing their attentions there uh, with international students returning to Australia and uh, migrant workers as well. Yeah, and I, and I guess if um, the New South Wales Parliament gives the legislation a, a thumbs up, other state governments could look at it as well, particularly if um, it helps in the re-election of the Premier. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't mean that's the kicker there, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, if we were to see this um, introduced in New South Wales, you're exactly right, likely to see other states follow suit, yeah. um, which of course will, uh, I guess, really put a flaw under first home buyer activity um, and certainly, I think, um, a, a bit of a flaw under activity. Yeah, great stuff. Thanks for joining us, Eleanor. Thank you for having me. That's Eleanor Cray from PropTrack. And that's the show for tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you on Monday. And remember, if you want more information about investing in, in particular stocks, have a look at switzerreport.com.au. Thanks for joining me. See you on Monday.